Welcome to Lisa Symposium 14. Uh, you are now watching the parallel session, uh, Multi-Messenger Astrophysics and Supermassive Black Holes. Uh, my name is Kiwamu Izumi. I am the chair of this exciting session today. Uh, we have uh, five speakers lining up today, uh, namely um, Alberto uh, Manjali and Martina Toscani and Elisa Bortles and Kelly Holly Bockelman and uh, Nathan Stan Lee. So before getting into the talk, uh, I give you an um, idea of how you raise questions. So the questions may be submitted via the, the chat at any time. And if you wish to ask a question verbally, uh, please raise a hand or include a comment with your question on the chat. And questions from the live stream on YouTube are also welcomed. And all questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. So um, thank you so much for watching. Um, so let's get into the, the talk. So the first speaker is Alberto uh, Manjali uh, from APC Paris on the multi-messenger synergies with Lisa counterparts prediction and the cosmological prospects. And you get 15 minutes for the talk. And I give you a heads up uh, once you spend uh, 12 minutes, uh, meaning you have three minutes left. Okay. Are you ready, uh, Alberto? Uh, yes, you should see my slide now. Yes. And uh, I, yeah, yeah, that's good. So um, Alberto, uh, please go ahead with your slides. Uh, okay, so hi everybody, I'm Alberto Mangiagli, um, a postdoc researcher at the Laboratorio of Astroparticular and Cosmology. And today I'm presenting some results based on a um, paper that we recently put on the archive about multi-messenger synergies with uh, a massive black hole binary LISA. So we start with a quick introduction. I will present the model for the electromagnetic counterpart that we have and give you also the number of electromagnetic counterparts that we expect. And in the end, I will just discuss some cosmological prospects that we can do with uh, uh, this type of sources. So let's start with a quick introduction. We, uh, let's let, we can distinguish a black hole in, into different populations. So we have the stellar black hole from 5 to 100 of solar masses. That are the ones that LIGO Virgo are currently observing in binaries. And then we have the population of massive black hole from uh, uh, 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 10 solar masses that we currently think of reside at the center of galaxies. So the- Alberto, is, I'm sorry. Yeah. Could you um, turn up your volume a little bit? Uh, your ah. voice may be a little bit shy. Sounds better? Yeah, it's better. Okay. Uh, so the idea is that when two galaxies merge, the massive black hole binary that in their center form a binary and eventually merge emitting um, gravitational waves. And in mid 2030s, LISA is going to observe the, the gravitational wave from the coalescence of this uh, uh, massive black hole binary. So well, here on the right, I guess that you are all familiar with this picture, but here you are looking at uh, signal to noise ratio in uh, redshift and total mass of the binary system. And uh, uh, you can see that there is a range of masses from 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 10, 7 solar masses, where we will actually be able to observe the entire population of uh, uh, merging uh, uh, massive black hole binary in the entire universe. And uh, we want to look at massive black hole binary at least for three good reasons. Uh, well, from an astrophysical point of view, we want to understand how these uh, uh, massive black hole binary form and evolve across cosmic time. From uh, a multi-messenger point of view, these are key sources because they are expected to be surrounded by gas. So uh, an electromagnetic counterpart can be triggered by the interaction between the disk and the binary. And uh, finally, we know that gravitational wave carry information on the luminosity distance of the source. So for example, if we can get the redshift information from an electromagnetic counterpart, we can combine the luminosity distance and redshift information to constrain cosmological parameters. So we started this project with the idea of improving the preview results done by uh, Nicola Tamanini in 2016. So we want to estimate the number of electromagnetic counterparts that we expect over a LISA mission and uh, uh, to see what type of cosmology we can do with these sources. So we performed two key improvements with respect to the previous work. So we improved the modeling of the electromagnetic counterpart. I'm going to discuss about it shortly. 
And we perform parameter estimation of the gravitational wave signal with a Bayesian code developed by Silvan Massart, is a beta. That is actually quite expensive from a computational point of view, but it's actually close to the realistic case. Um, as a starting point, we need a, a population of massive black hole binaries. So there are huge uncertainties on, the, on this type of population. So we have three different models to bracket our uncertainties. We have a light model where black holes start at uh, 10 to the 3 solar masses, a heavy model where black holes start around 10 to the 4, 10 to the 6 solar masses, and then a heavy no delay models, which is actually the same of the heavy one, but we remove the delay between the galaxy merge and the massive black hole binary merger. Without entering details, uh, you can see this model as an optimistic one because it provides many more uh, uh, massive black hole binary mergers. We also don't know what type of electromagnetic counterpart we expect uh, from these events. So when you do not know the type of electromagnetic counterpart, you model in uh, all the possible band. So we model the electromagnetic counterpart in optical, radio, and X-ray. And clearly, we have to take into account also some telescope to study this counterpart. So for example, for uh, optical, we can use LSST or Vera Rubin in uh, the future. Uh, in this way, we can uh, both identify the galaxy and get to the redshift. The redshift in our case is important because at the end we want to do cosmology. Uh, for radio, we have SKA, with which we can identify the, the, galaxies, the galaxy and then get to the redshift, for example, with uh, ELT. Uh, for X-ray, we consider Athena. There has been discussion about the scoping of Athena mission and uh, but before actually there is not yet been uh, uh, defined so we keep the standard configuration of Athena um, so again in X-ray we can just do identification and then we can get the redshift with uh, ELT we also had two, uh, two variations uh, so we include the possibility of AGN obscuration so the possibility that the same uh, gas that is producing the electromagnetic counterpart is also absorbing a fraction of the radiation and we also assume the, we also take into account the possibility of a collimated radio emission because in the original paper, they assume just an isotropic radio emission. So here we try to improve a bit, take into account a jet with a 30 degree opening angle. So this scheme summarizes our procedure. So we start really from the raw catalog. So the uh, number of massive black hole binary merger in here, plus the property of the gas and of the host galaxies. Uh, we compute the detectability of the gravitational wave signal, so we select all the, all, all the system with SNR larger than 10. Uh, on this subset, we evaluate the detectability of the electromagnetic counterpart, so we uh, just select the system whose counterpart can be detected in optical, radio, or X-ray. And then on this subset of, the, of uh, events, we perform the parameter estimation to have uh, an estimate of the uh, scale localization of the source. So in this, end, in this way, at the end, we get the rate of electromagnetic counterpart, which uh, um, in our study are defined as system with SNR larger than 10, electromagnetic counterpart detectable, and uh, uh, sufficiently well localized uh, sky position, depending on the telescope. So we also have two different scenarios, a uh, maximizing one and minimizing one to, again, bracket our uncertainties. In the maximizing one, we uh, neglect obscuration and we assume isotropic radio emission. In the minimizing one, uh, we have obscuration and we include the, uh, a collimated radio emission with an opening angle of 30 degrees. We found that, uh, uh, as you will see, these are the two, two properties that are actually most affecting our uh, estimate. So now we can start looking at the, at the distribution. So for example, here the um, blue dot dashed line corresponds to the total catalog and the solid blue line represents to represent just a system with SNR larger than 10. And this, as you can see, for example, in the heavy model, we are able to recover the entire catalogs. Uh, in the light model, we are missing a fraction of light and high redshift events. Um, this is expected because LISA is not really sensitive in this region. Then we can apply the requirement on the detectability of electromagnetic counterpart. And this, in this way, we can select a system at a ratio smaller than eight. And in terms of total mass, we select a preferential system at a large total mass value uh, because typically they have more gas, so the electromagnetic counterpart is brighter. And then we can apply the uh, requirement on the scale localization of the source. And uh, you can see that in this way, we, again, we are losing a fraction of systems. So for example, here you can compare the 
uh, dark dash, the green line will be uh, solid, bright line. And you can see that the loss, the loss is uh, particularly significant for light model. Um, again, it is expected because uh, since the system are light, the parameter estimation is, going, is not going to be actually really great. <clears throat> and we can also look at the magnitude or fluxes that we expect from the, uh, from the subset of electromagnetic counterpart. <clears throat> and as you can see, the uh, magnitude, for example, here in optical on the upper left, uh, the magnitude are all about 25, 26. And you can also see that when we include obscuration, the, uh, the number of electromagnetic counterparts dramatically decrease. Uh, for Athena, the, the peak in flux is uh, at uh, minus 15, but clearly it extends also to lower fluxes. And you can also see that there is a dramatic decrease when we move from the, when we move in SKA from the isotropic case to the case where we took into account an opening angle of 30 degrees. So bottom line of this slide is that we expect a few and faint sources in Fourier. And to be more specific here on this slide, you see the number of electromagnetic counterpart uh, for the different strategies. So let's just look at the heavy model for simplicity here, the middle line. Uh, you can see that, for example, without obscuration in four years in optical, we have something like three electromagnetic counterpart. But if we include obscuration, the number goes below one. Uh, for SKA, we have 15 electromagnetic counterpart in the isotropic case. But if we include, for example, the opening angle of 30 degree, uh, we have three electromagnetic counterpart. For Athena, we have three, four electromagnetic counterpart without obscuration. But again, if we include obscuration, the uh, the number goes below one. Uh, so you can see that indeed there is a dramatic decrease when we include the obscuration and the radio jet. Uh, here on this table, you look, the, you can see the number of electromagnetic counterparts when you combine the different strategies. So uh, taking into account that maybe the same events can be observed with different instruments. And uh, uh, again, overall, we expect 15 electromagnetic counterparts in the other model and in, in, the case, in the maximizing case. And in imaging one, we have two, three electromagnetic counterparts. So during this work, we also have to deal with uh, multimodal events. Uh, so multimodal events are systems whose sky posterior distribution is indeed multimodal in the sky. So here there are a couple of examples. So uh, for example, here on the left, we have what we call the unimodal events. Uh, just because as you can see, the sky posterior distribution is uh, uh, a nice ellipse in the sky. So here the uh, blue contours represent the result from the Markov chain Monte Carlo analysis. The dark ellipses represent the result from Fisher, and the uh, black uh, uh, square represent the, re the actual binary position. So you can see that, for example, for unimodal system, everything behaves well. Um, for, uh, then we have what we call uh, bimodal events or two modes events in the sense that. Uh, um, these are events whose sky posterior distribution presents two different modes in the sky. And uh, well, as you can see that the Fisher by construction is uh, uh, able to recover just the single binary, uh, just, the, just one spot of the binary, but the posterior distribution actually uh, gives two different modes. And uh, then we have what we call eight modes events, because the, for this system we have eight different spots in the sky and just one of them is the two one. And there is nothing much that we can do about these uh, uh, multimodal events. We know that they are going to be present in the analysis because uh, these arise from uh, the degeneracies inside the Lisa pattern function or uh, due to the fact that we do not have enough signal at uh, low or high frequency. And uh, as you might guess, uh, uh, this system poses a serious issue when you want to look for electromagnetic counterparts because clearly you have to look at different spots in the sky. However, we also found some- and You have three minutes left. Thank you. Um, so for example, here on the left, I'm uh, showing the probability for the two modes events in the primary and the secondary mode. So here the primary is the true one where actually the binary is, and the secondary one is the spurious one, the fake one. And as you can see, the primary mode, the true one is actually contains uh, uh, always more probability than the secondary one. Uh, so we say that overall, we should be able to uh, spot the true binary position just looking at the probability. And this is actually quite interesting because uh, on the other end, if we look at the contribution of these two modes events to the 
total number of electromagnetic counterparts that you're expecting for here, you can see that actually the contribution is not that negligible. So it's around 20, 30% of the total number. On the other way, for HMOS events, you can see that the number of electromagnetic counterparts that you expect is less than 0 0.5 in four years. So uh, already from this, we can say that HMOS events can be considered as negligible in the estimate of the electromagnetic counterpart. This is actually quite uh, useful because, for example, if we look instead of the probability for HMOS events, uh, we can see that uh, uh, for eight most events, uh, all the modes are more or less equiprobable. Uh, so here you can see, well, this corresponds to the two binary position and all these uh, seven are the spurious one. As you can see, the probability is more or less around 10% in all cases. So uh, they are equiprobable, but they are not really uh, contributed significantly in terms of uh, numbers. So uh, bottom line is that again, multimodal events do not affect significantly the number of electromagnetic counterpart. So finally, just some uh, preliminary results on cosmology. Um, here you can see the posterior distribution that we have on omega matter and H0 from, the, from one realization of the maximizing model. So here we have something like uh, uh, 14 electromagnetic counterpart, and you can see that we are able to constrain H at around, at around 4%. This is an average realization. But uh, for example, taking into account that we also have the minimizing model where we have a less electromagnetic counterpart, I would say that at the end, we should be able to constrain H not around uh, 10%. So here my conclusion. Uh, my conclusion is that uh, multi-messenger and cosmology with massive black hole binary is going to be challenging. Uh, the peak of the distribution in terms of redshift is around uh, uh, redshift 2. And the typical binary that we are going to observe uh, will have a total mass of 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, maybe a few 10 to the 7. So the electromagnetic counterpart is not going to be extremely bright for this type of sources. So we need to accurately plan any follow-up strategies in order to maximize the number of uh, counterpart that we can observe. Uh, from cosmology, TV still preliminary results, but probably we will be able to constrain H not around 10%, but the idea is that clearly we can combine massive black hole binary with other type of sources in LISA, so like stellar black hole binary and Emory. Uh, then we talked about that a uh, couple of days ago. Um, in order to construct this sort of uh, um, cosmic uh, uh, distance ladder in terms of gravitational wave and to constrain uh, cosmology. So thanks for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Alberto. So the floor is now open for the questions. If you have any questions, please raise your hand or you can type it in the chat. Okay, I see a chat window, a question from Danny um, saying that if there is a simple explanation for that, how did you choose the values of the jet combination angles, meaning six and 30 degrees? Uh, yeah, there are basically different model in um, uh, that you can find in the literature, uh, uh, and uh, we just took the two representative value. Uh, I didn't discuss the six degree because clearly, uh, sorry, because clearly if you take into account the six degree, you can see from this table that uh, we do not have any electromagnetic counterpart. Uh, so we just took 30 degrees uh, because we found it in the literature, honestly. Okay, um, I see a hands up from Alberto Cesana. Uh, would you be able to speak up? <clears throat> yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a couple of short questions still also related to the counterparts. In the case of, uh, of, of the radio emission, uh, did you consider also the possibility of uh, having a compact radio core? So in that case, you know, the compact radio core uh, might be essentially isotropical emitting. So you won't need uh, collimation, you know, a collimated jet pointing at you. Of course, the downside is that this might, might be less luminous. So I was wondering whether you uh, consider that. I think not, because for the radio, basically we assume the same model of uh, Nicola Tamanini. So okay, so there's no... There. Yeah. <laughs> And if I may, uh, can you say something about the obscuration uh, that you assumed for the X-ray? What did you assume uh, for like as NH? Maybe you said it. I, I for... Okay, well, not that they're just a reference. Uh, well, basically, we took the expression from uh, WEDA uh, 2014. 
per gli invasi mm. di, uh, di fraction of obscure di IGN. Um, okay. So from, uh, basically from uh, the catalog, we have information on the acrylic gas. Uh, the expression here from uh, Hueda basically are based on the uh, X-ray luminosity. So the idea is that we start from the catalog, we compute the X-ray luminosity, and then we use the, this correction fraction to, to take into account obscuration. Okay, thanks. But we have, we have a distribution of uh, hydrogen column density. Well, okay. From, uh, this paper. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. And I take another question. Uh, in Viviane, uh, yes, uh, up, yeah. please. Yes, I have a quick question on, on slide nine. I saw that the um, the heavy delay and no delay model gave the same number of counterparts in the maxim in the minimizing model. Can you can you give an intuition for this? Uh, yeah, the, the point is that. Uh, As I said, it can be considered as an optimistic model in the sense that it provides many more massive black hole binary merger. But the point is, is that you have yep. to look uh, where these merger are located. So, for example, oh. if we go, well, okay, we can just take this slide. Uh, so, it, the point is that it provides many more massive black hole binary merger, but typically at high redshift. And okay. also, the amount of gas mm. surrounding this binary is not uh, typically that large. So, at the end, mm. you know, the fact that you have Okay, a lot of massive black hole binary merger, but a higher redshift at the end does not contribute significantly to the number of electromagnetic counterparts. Okay, I see. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, um, I think it's time to move on. So thank you so much, Alberto, and let's thank the speaker. Um, so the next speaker up is... Uh, Martina Toscani uh, from from uh, uh, from Laboratory des to Infinis <laughs> on tidal disruption events as way to study black holes. So please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Okay, so can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for this opportunity. My name is Martina, and I am a postdoctoral researcher at uh, Laboratoire de Deux Infinis in Toulouse. And uh, today, I would like to show you what has been so far my main research topic, that is the study of tidal disruption events, uh, in particular as a way to study or to better um, understand black holes. So let me start from the beginning. And okay, what is a tidal disruption event for sure TDE? Well, a TDE takes place when a star orbiting around a massive black hole gets disrupted due to the black hole tides that overwhelm the stellar self gravity. After the disruption, we have that roughly half of the stellar debris are expected to uh, circularize around the black hole and eventually form an accretion disk. We observed these events uh, since the 90s, and uh, so far they have been one of the most powerful way to uh, detect otherwise uh, quiescent massive black hole through the universe. As a matter of fact, uh, while the stellar debris accretes onto the massive black hole, we have a production of very luminous electromagnetic flares. And uh, uh, to present, we have been able to observe around 100 tidal disruption events, mainly in two bands of the electromagnetic spectrum, optical and X-ray. Yet, we can uh, study these events also through other possible messenger neutrino, for example, because we expect the uh, production of a high energy neutrino from the later stages when we also have production of jets in, in some cases. And actually there have been some uh, potential candidates of astrophysical neutrinos from tidal disruption events. And uh, finally, uh, they also emit gravitational waves. In particular, we expect tidal disruption events to uh, produce gravitational wave radiation during the whole process. But here in this talk, I will just focus on the gravitational wave contribution from the disruption phase. That is the signal generated by the time variation of the black star mass quadrupole. 
So let me uh, say something more quantitative of this signal. It is a monochromatic burst with a maximum strain and frequency that are approximated by this two analytical formula that you can see on the top of the slide. So uh, for typical values of the parameter that describe this kind of system, we have that uh, the strain H peaks around 10 to minus 22, while the frequency um, span from the milliards, that is uh, the frequency window where Lisa will be more sensitive to the detriers, that is the frequency window where we hope uh, there will be future detriers observatories. So at this point of the presentation, let me stress that uh, so far we have already detected tidal disruption events, mainly for electromagnetic radiation, and this radiation allow, allows us uh, to see the later stages of the disruption. Yet in the future, we will also observe the, um, tidal disruption events with gravitational waves, and thus, for the first time, we will directly access the disruption phase of the star. Yet, before observing tidal disruption events, we need to know in advance how this signal looks like and also what kind of information we can extract from this signal. In order to um, answer to this question, to face this problem, I have implemented a tool for the numerical derivation of gravitational wave emission from tidal disruption events. So I implemented this tool in Phantom, which is a smoothed particle aerodynamics code, uh, particularly well suited for three-dimensional simulation of non-accessing metric systems like tidal disruption events. And basically, basically my algorithm is the numerical transcription of the quadrupole approximation for gravitational wave emission. So I created this tool that uh, uh, on the fly during the simulation is uh, uh, providing the values of the polarization amplitude h plus h cross uh, as a function of time, and then started to use this tool to describe the gravitational wave signal from tidal destruction events. So in this plot, you can see uh, the gravitational wave signal that uh, we obtain uh, for a sun-like star disrupted by a static 10 to 6 solar mass black hole at 20 megaparsing from us. And we are observing the system phase on. Actually, these results are quite reassuring because they uh, both agree with the analytical estimates that I showed you before, but also with some previous uh, results in the literature, like the one of Kobayashi et al. in 2004. Once I created this tool, I started to uh, invest, to use it in order to investigate the parameter space that actually describes the disruption events and to see how different values of the parameter uh, involved can affect this signal. So if you are interested in this, you can find all the results of this investigation on this uh, catalog online. And just to show uh, for instance, uh, one of the information that, at least in theory, we can extract from the observation of this signal, this is the black hole spin, because uh, we can find that the different black hole spin affect the gravitational wave signal from a tidal disruption event. And in particular, we have that this gravitational signal increases for higher values of the black hole spin in case of retrograde orbit, while the opposite uh, um, trend is observed in case of prograde orbits. Okay, so now that uh, we have a tool that uh, allows us to uh, derive the gravitational wave signal from material disruption events for any configuration of the parameters that we want, we also need to um, understand how many tidal disruption events we actually expect to see in gravitational waves. So how many detection? Well, let me say that the answer to this question changes a lot depending on the interferometers that we uh, are considering, because I anticipate that if the Church observatories like the SIGO will become a reality, we will observe thousands of data disruption events per year up to cosmological uh, redshift in gravitational waves. But what about LISA? Well, the situation about LISA 
at least in the case of main sequence stars and supermassive black holes, seems to be a bit more pessimistic, as you can see from this plot, where on the vertical axis, I show the number of fatal disruption events in 10 years, assuming that uh, um, 10 years is the um, lifetime of the LISA mission, while on the horizontal axis, I show the signal to noise ratio. The vertical red line corresponds to signal to noise ratio one, and the uh, pink horizontal line corresponds to one failure disruption event in 10 years. So you can see that the curve, the blue curve, actually is above the threshold of one failure disruption event in 10 years only at low signal to noise ratio, where basically we cannot expect to have a detection by LISA. So the situation seems a bit uh, dramatic, but we can see if gravitational lensing could improve this scenario. So what is gravitational lensing? Well, uh, we have this effect when there is a massive object that is the lens between us, the observer, and the source that is emitting the signal we want to study. So this massive object is actually um, bending the surrounding space-time, and this, is, this causes a deviation in the path of the, of the signal that we want to observe. In particular, here I focus on strong lensing and on uh, a very interesting consequence of strong lensing, the magnification, that is the amplification of the signal. So how can I understand if uh, my signal is magnified and how much is magnified? Well, I need to calculate this uh, quantity, which is uh, given a population of sources, at a, in this case, at a distortion event, of course, at a given redshift, at uh, given a, a distribution of lenses, I want to calculate the magnification distribution. In order to calculate this magnification distribution, I need to derive two main ingredients. One is this small p, which is basically the magnification probability density function that at, uh, for a fixed redshift that depends only on the distribution of lenses that I choose. So here in this quantity, there is no information of the astrophysical source that I want to study. In this case, or in this plot, I am uh, obtaining these curves uh, considering as lenses galaxies, but then in future I want to consider more sophisticated lens distribution to calculate this quantity. And the second uh, main ingredient that I need to calculate is the number of observable tidal disruption events per unit uh, of uh, redshift bin as a function of mu the magnification factor mu. So you can see in this plot that uh, this quantity, the n over the z, actually is decreasing for higher value of the redshift, which makes sense because I have a cut in the signal to noise ratio, but is also increasing for higher mu, which is also reasonable because for higher mu, the signal to noise ratio limit for detection becomes smaller and smaller. So with these two main ingredients, I can calculate this, uh, prob this uh, uh, probability, the magnification probability distribution. And here you can see for different redshift uh, uh, the, the values of this, uh, of this distribution. And from this kind of plot, I can get two main uh, results. One is uh, given, uh, assuming that I observe a tidal destruction event at a, a specific redshift, like for instance 0 0.28, I can calculate what is the probability that my tidal disruption event is actually magnified more than a specific value. Like for instance, more than 16 is 27%, more than 100 is 2%. And then the second thing that I can calculate from this plot is uh, at each redshift, I can calculate an average magnification factor so that actually I can estimate what is the number of failure disruption event above the signal to noise ratio threshold when I assuming a distribution of lensings. But so far I still don't have this number because it's work in progress and I still need to finish the calculation. 
So maybe Lansing can actually improve the situation for uh, detection of tidal destruction events uh, uh, with LISA, and for sure will be interesting also for the shared observatories. But uh, before concluding this presentation, let me show also another interesting calculation that can be done with tidal destruction events in gravitational waves. We can provide uh, an Martina, estimate. Martina, you got two minutes left. OK. Sorry, two minutes left. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We can provide an estimate of the gravitational wave background from this population, and it is what I did. In particular, distinguishing between nuclear tidal disruption events, where I assume main sequence stars disrupted by supermassive black hole in the course of galaxies, and the globular tidal disruption events, where I assume white dwarfs disrupted by intermediate mass black hole in globular clusters. So I did the calculation for these uh, two class of tidal disruption events and what I get, what I got, mainly two results. The first is that for both the classes, as a consequence of the impulsive nature of, this, of the gravitational signal from a TD, this uh, background signal is proportional to the frequency to minus one half, which is a peculiar feature of tidal disruption events. And then the second result is that uh, while the background from main sequence stars uh, actually is in a uh, part of the frequency window where there are no uh, interferometers sensitive enough to detect, to detect it, the situation can be different if we consider the background from globular tidal disruption events, so white dwarf and intermediate mass black hole. It can be very interesting for the shared observatories, and a possible detection can constrain the distribution of intermediate mass black hole in the universe up to ratio 3. So let me conclude just showing the final slide with the take home messages and I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Martina. Uh, uh, so we can now take some questions. Okay, I see a hand up. Uh, Shiho, you are the first. Yeah, yeah, nice talk. And uh, so, yeah, about uh, gravitational lensing, and uh, yeah, you don't have it result yet, but uh, just wondering uh, anything by the amplification, can we detect uh, prompt X-ray emission? S some of the same factor X-ray emission going to amplify it. And if we have X-ray detection slide to the, maybe help detection of gravitational wave itself, and uh, considering future X-ray emission and uh, application factor, any chance we can detect X-ray flash at the moment or tidal disruption. Or... Yeah, um, I mean, if I understand correctly, uh, well, in this case, I was talking, of course, about gravitational lensing of the gravitational wave signal, but um, my idea is to actually um, complete the yes, calculation. Yes, but the same process, same yeah, physics. Exactly. Apply, yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, actually, uh, this is what I'm planning to do, to complete also the calculation with gravitational lensing of the electromagnetic counterpart and see what I what I get. Yeah, I agree. Okay, yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah that's pretty interesting. Okay, um, so the next, uh, Roberto, you are the next. Can you speak up? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Martina, for the, the, the nice talk. So I have two questions, both related on lensing. Uh, first question is, uh, for, the len for the lens distribution, are you using uh, a catalog of observed lens or is it like, like a simulation? Second question is, uh, you seem to uh, limit yourself to redshift up to one, uh, which I guess is due to the fact that uh, if you put the um, the TD further away, the, the SNL is smaller, but it's also true that the lens probability is higher. And uh, so I, I was just wondering if uh, redshift equal one is really where these two effects com compensate each other. Okay, thank you. So as for the first, so these are for the moment just preliminary results where I am assuming a distribution as like a Schechter function with z-dependence, but I actually aim to use the illustrious catalog, which is a simulation actually of galaxies as a lens distribution. And uh, I can also further improve the lens distribution using some constraint simulation that can actually map better the universe at the lower redshift. As for the second question, um, well, actually, I also have the results up, up, uh, 
up to Redshift uh, 10. But I have to say that, uh, um, yeah, uh, at very high Redshift, uh, um, the signal to noise uh, ratio will be very, very low. And also, um, uh, I mean, it's true that we have a compensation because uh, uh, it's true what you said that um, a tire redshift, the probability to be lensed is actually higher, but not in such a way that we can have uh, some uh, very important shift in the signal to noise ratio and then a possible uh, detection by ELISA. This is why actually I, I show in this uh, talk uh, up to redshift uh, one, two, I don't remember exactly. Thank you. Okay, uh, I have a quick question. Um, so when you uh, compute the TD backgrounds, uh, what kind of IMBH population um, did you assume? Yeah, in this case, I assume that the population of IMBH is in the range 10 to 3, 10 to 5 solar masses, and I assume in them to live in uh, uh, globular clusters, where initially I assumed that each globular cluster at, uh, has one uh, um, is an occupation fraction of one of an intermediate mass black hole. And then, of course, I reduce this, uh, this number to see uh, how this uh, estimate can change. Mm -hmm. But for instance, there are actually, I think, many ways to uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. improve this calculation, considering also uh, intermediate mass black hole in dwarf galaxies. And uh, maybe even, I think I can also go down to 100 uh, solar masses as an intermediate mass black hole in the mass range, which is true that. Uh, it's the signal, to, the um, gravitational wave signal is actually weaker for uh, lighter massive black holes. But it's also true that we know, thanks to LIGO and VIGO, that these light uh, massive, intermediate massive black holes actually do exist. So it can be actually more interesting. Uh, there are many fallouts that are possible for this calculation, actually. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. I, I just wanted to check out what kind of assumptions, you know, you took. Okay. All right, thank you so much, uh, Martina. I think it's time Thanks. to move on to the uh, next uh, talk. So the next one is uh, from uh, Elisa Botales uh, from uh, University Delhi Studi di Milano, Mi Milano Bio Bicocca, sorry. And he, uh, she is, she is going to talk about gas stars and gravitational waves on the main driver of massive black hole binaries path to coalescence. So Elisa, uh, would you please go ahead? Sure. Thanks for the introduction. Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So, okay, uh, so th this uh, presentation, this work uh, has been done in collaboration with my colleagues here in Bicocca, Alessia Franchini, Matteo Bonetti, and Alberto Cesana. And in particular, it focuses on uh, the small sh scale shrinking of massive black hole binaries. So let's first of all start from the basis. First of all, uh, since we are all interested in LISA here, we know that LISA is uh, uh, sensible to the merger of of, uh, two supermassive or supermassive black holes, but in order for them to emit uh, like a, a sensible amount of gravitational waves, those two black holes need to get very close. And uh, in order to have two massive black holes in the same galaxy, we expect to need galaxy mergers. But galaxy mergers occur at much larger scales. So we really need to understand how the two massive black holes can shrink from this scale down to the gravitational wave emission stage. And uh, actually, uh, the, the first uh, uh, you know, uh, seminar work that really uh, try to understand how this works dates back to the 80s. And uh, the, the simple feature that was put forward was the dynamical friction, which is a sort of gravitational drag against uh, dark matter, gas, and star, will basically uh, ferry the binary down to the bound stage, at which the interactions with stars uh, will help the further shrinking, possibly aided by the effect of gas which of course would give rise uh, possibly also to some counterparts. And then around the milliparsec scale, we would have the emission of gravitational waves and the final spiral. In the last few years though, uh, this simple picture got way more complex just because people try to put a more complex uh, physics and more realistic uh, uh, 
environmental properties and study the, the binary evolution uh, in this like moralistic context. And you see that we have uh, way, way more processes compared to what we were expecting before. Uh, and uh, in particular today, what I want to talk to you about uh, refers to the small scale binary evolution. The small scale uh, uh, evolution namely means uh, what happens when the binary manages to uh, be bound in a Keplerian system. And I'm just going to um, show you what happens if we combine the different processes that can actually happen at the same time. I think this is a very important thing to highlight already here because most studies that try to infer the evolution of binaries uh, in this stage either only assume stellar uh, hardening, so starts to actually aid the binary to reach the gravitational wave emission stage, or other words, just focus on the possible presence of uh, a disk of gas that can also influence the binary evolution. But in fact, especially if we focus on least sources, so we target relatively small uh, massive black holes, we expect uh, that uh, both gas and stars uh, would be present at the same time. And so in this work, we specifically wanted to understand what happens when both ingredients are together uh, present in the host system and also to add the, the evolution driven by gravitational waves. More specifically, what is stellar driven hardening, stellar driven evolution? So basically when we have a bound binary, each time a star gets close enough to the binary, it undergoes a, a interaction that is uh, uh, typically ending in a slingshot ejection of the star out of the system and the binary shrinks in the interaction so that as many stars uh, get close to the binary, the binary can shrink further and further. When we have some gas around, even if uh, kind of ironically, uh, some time ago gas was thought to be the, the, the perfect thing to really help the binary shrinking. Uh, later work kind of suggested that depending on the configuration of the gaseous disk around the binary and the binary mass ratio and so forth, uh, it is unclear whether gas can actually shrink or in some case even expand the binary. And if in some configurations there is this binary possible expansion, this is very important to figure out for this because in principle it could mean that the binary surrounded by gas would never uh, enter the, the gravitational wave emission stage because uh, this effect prevents their evolution. Of course, if instead the binary uh, manages to reach a separation small enough, then we all know that we have gravitational wave emission that is very efficient in driving coalescence. So here I'm going to present the ingredients that we put together in this semi-analytical calculation to study uh, the evolution driven by uh, both the stars, gas and gravitational waves. First of all, the stellar driven hardening is kind of very well understood in the literature and uh, um, we have that the uh, derivative of the binary semi-major axis in time scales as minus the semi-major axis squared. This just means that as the binary shrinks and shrinks, the effect of uh, uh, stars in extracting energy get less and less efficient, right? Uh, if we have a gravitational wave emission, instead, uh, we probably all know that from Peter's formulas, the derivative of the binary semi-major axis in time sky scales as minus one over the cube of the binary semi-major axis, meaning that we are a sort of uh, runaway process. When it starts, it cannot really be reverted easily. And what do we assume for the gas-driven evolution instead? To be very pessimistic and really explore the worst possible configuration for LISA, we just assume that when there is gas, it can only expand the binary. And in particular, we uh, um, uh, took this work from Diego Munoz, which is in uh, agreement with many other works that study the 
same problem, uh, uh, according to which the uh, uh, derivative of the binary semi-major axis in time, uh, the, the, the semi-major axis expands proportionally to the binary semi-major axis. Of course, uh, depending on the normalization of this curve, we can have that gas expansion actually occurs or it can be neglected. Uh, Specifically, I want to show you that uh, the normalization of this curve depends on the mass accretion rate of the binary divided by the binary mass. Uh, and in particular, in this work, what we uh, assumed it is that the binary always uh, accretes at a fixed ratio of its Eddington limit, and we uh, named this uh, ratio as f -ed the Eddington ratio. We also tried uh, different prescriptions, but we found that this to be the worst case scenario for binary expansion. So we, we stick to this here. Um, first of all, uh, what I want to show you is that just by combining the equations I showed you so far, what we were already uh, able to work out is that gas expansion is expected to play a non-negligible role, so it is curved to be above here, only when the binary accretes at a fraction of its identity ratio, which is uh, above 10 percent and in some cases at lower binary masses even above 50 percent. So the binary needs to create an enormous amount of gas to expand if gas, if stars and gravitational waves are also included in the evolution. Also another important question is that can the binary expand forever? Of course not. Uh, and in particular what we um, uh, implemented in, in this uh, work is that uh, the binary stops its expansion as it hits uh, the disk self-gravitating radius. This is basically uh, the radius above which uh, the disk starts developing structures as parts or start collapsing and there is no evidence of binary expansion if the disk is in this regime. So we just stop the expansion here. And uh, here is just the dependence of the self-gravitating radius on the uh, Eddington ratio and the binary mass. And uh, uh, also by implementing this further ingredient in our equations, we were basically uh, able to say that there is uh, no possible expansion occurring for binaries whose mass is above 10 to the 8 solar masses, which is not really in the visa band, but it's at least good to know. And now, instead, what I'm showing you are the evolutionary tracks of binaries that uh, undergo some uh, expansion. In particular, here I'm showing the case of a binary with 10 to the 4 solar masses, total mass, uh, and equal mass. This is a rather low mass binary, but just because uh, lower mass binaries undergo more efficient expansion, we find. So this is sort of, again, a worst case scenario. Uh, so what I'm showing you here, here is the binary semi-major axis as a function of time, binary, binary mass as a function of time. The residence time, so time, um, how much time the binary spends at each separation as a function of the binary uh, semi-major axis and mass as a function of the binary semi-major axis. So from those plots, you see that if the binary is not accreting, so the gray line, its evolution is rather smooth and no one re and nothing really uh, hinders uh, the, the in spiral. When we start putting F Eddington to 0.6, we see that the binary undergoes a little bit of delay in its evolution, but it does not actually expand because uh, gas expansion is not uh, strong enough. If we put the binary creating at the Eddington limit instead, what we see is that the binary does undergo some expansion because uh, gas is efficient in expanding it, it hits the, uh, by the disk self-gravitating radius. It stalls on the disk self-gravitating radius, but in this time, its mass has grown a lot because it's uh, accreting at Eddington. So at this separation in uh, about uh, 400 million years, uh, this separation is enough for gravitational waves to drive its coalescence, so the binary would coalesce anyways just by increasing a lot its mass. If we put uh, the Eddington accre the accretion even to super Eddington, so uh, 
uh, three is the, is the value here. Everything happens the same, but just faster because accretion is more efficient, expansion is more efficient. So overall, the binary would just merge quickly um, compared to the Eddington limit case. Uh, uh, so, uh, this is interesting because uh, what we see here is that in the case of binary expansion, what we have is that uh, not that the binary would not shrink, but instead that uh, um, binaries in the Lisa band would eventually end up uh, in the band of PTA just because their mass could be enhanced so much. Um, and also, so Lisa, you have, you have two minutes left. Perfect, thank you. Uh, okay, so here what I'm showing you is uh, the, in the time scale over which all those processes occur as a function of uh, the assumed adding, uh, Eddington ratio uh, and uh, the different colors mark binaries with different total mass. Uh, and in particular, what you see is that uh, as uh, the binary reach, accretes uh, mass at uh, around the Eddington limit, the in spiral time scale can get larger, but never larger than a factor more or less 10 compared with the case in which the binary is actually not accreting at all. So this just means that the binaries do actually merge in a time scale that is uh, much smaller than a Hubble time, even if uh, they undergo this putative expansion phase. And even more interestingly, uh, this uh, enhancement in the time scale for the evolution could even just mean that we have more time to find them in the electromagnetic band, because uh, if they are accreting a lot, they possibly are even emitting uh, a lot of electromagnetic radiation. Um, yeah, and uh, so here is the, my doggy bag for you to bring home with all the key messages. So first of all, I really, really want to stress that uh, in most uh, um, um, LISA uh, uh, binaries, for most LISA binaries, we expect to have the host environment to have both stars and gas. And we need to consider both those ingredients to really understand how the binary evolution <laughs> proceeds. Uh, second key message is that even if uh, we assume the worst possible scenario, so uh, gas uh, drives the expansion of the binary, this is not dramatic, this does not dramatically impact the time scale over which the binary is reached to coalescence as the, uh, the expansion gets into a shrinking as the binary accretes enough. Mass. Uh, also, this expansion phase could, in principle, uh, lengthen the time scale over which binaries can be targeted by electromagnetic surveys. Uh, and also, this expansion can uh, put some binaries that were instead in the LISA band into the uh, band of pulsar timing array observatories. And here I stop my presentation and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Elisa. Um, any questions? Yes, I see. Uh, Nicola, you are the first. Uh, can you speak up? Yes. Hi, it's Elisa. Yeah. So, so I have a question um, regarding uh, basically time scales and lengths, if you want. Uh, you were saying that uh, even here at the end, you're saying that binaries might go from the Elisa band to the PTA bands due to the expansion, due to the gas accretion. Uh, but yes. I didn't understand, can you clarify actually, are these effects of gas accretion and stellar hardening happening on the same time scales? Because I, as long as I understood, like stellar hardening was coming before gravitational wave emission could dominate. So I, I was expecting this to be before the binary was, was in the PTA or these frequencies, let's say. Ah, okay, yeah. So uh, basically here, uh, of course, uh, 
uh, in the initial phase of the evolution, we just uh, have a, a stellar hardening and uh, possibly also this effect of this expansion that are actually playing a role. But the, the, key, point, the key point uh, here is that at some point, the binary would stall at the separation. And for that given separation, uh, the binary mass uh, would increase so much just because of uh, um, its uh, very high accretion rate that this separation is enough uh, to start uh, uh, emitting uh, a lot of gravitational waves and then merge. And so this is basically um, uh, in the PTA band if it accreted so much while uh, as it was uh, undergoing the initial shrinking and then expansion, this was not really in the gravitational wave, uh, not so much in the gravitational wave driven regime. Okay, thank you. So At least I for this now, case, now, now the, yeah. yeah. No, sorry. I understood now the concept because the time scale is changing because the masses are changing because they are facing, okay, okay. Yeah. And can I have a follow-up question actually on this? Uh, yes. If, this is the case, actually, I would expect a lot of binaries to stall at some specific distances or let's say at some specific ranges. So I would expect this maybe to give a bump in uh, PTA uh, stochastic backgrounds uh, spectrum, let's say, uh, or any other effects that's, uh, that's maybe interesting to look at. Yeah, so absolutely. So uh, this is a very interesting point. In here, what we uh, just assumed is that uh, this would be the, the uh, self-gravitating radius. Uh, but in principle, actually, uh, the, the real scale at which you expect the binary to stop expanding is the scale at which the, the disk is not there or all the gas that was around was accreted. And this is really, at that point, it gets a really system independent because in this configuration we just assumed the worst case scenario so that there was an infinite amount of gas uh, in the system that could be accreted by the binary. So I guess that the particular uh, you know uh, scale at which uh, uh, this uh, stalling would occur uh, should we more realistically the scale at which uh, the disk of gas uh, stops existing or ex is exhausted because of accretion, if it makes and, sense. And, and this is not PTA frequency, for example. Just Sorry? to make sure this is not in the PTA frequencies. Um, well, uh, this is a good question. I guess uh, in order to really understand this, we should put uh, all those processes uh, uh, into like a realistic uh, environments uh, with uh, like depending on their initial mass and so on and so forth and really see uh, also assuming an amount of gas uh, in the central region like uh, how much we can uh, have this uh, expansion going on uh, but I, I think this model is a little too simplistic and uh, pushing to the limits to really have a clear answer for that okay thank you okay uh, although I see a hands up from Alastair, uh, I think it's time. Uh, I think it's time to move on to the coffee break. So um, thank Plus. you so much, Elisa. Thanks. And let's have a coffee, coffee break and meet at, I think, 10.15 in UTC, and meaning it's uh, 19.15 in Japan. I guess it's only me. Uh, anyway, so... Uh, stay tuned, and that concludes the first half of the uh, 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 this parallel session. Thank you. <laughs>